bedtime story with some questions for you to take into your sleep space. So if you have been listening to me as I post these, you will know that between the last time that I posted and now, I have had a little piece that I put together as I did my own shadow work. Going into the summer of peace, I needed to talk about where I had been as a healer and what sort of deals with the devil I had had to make as a healer in order to do the kind of healing I wanted to do and one of them was uh, circumcisions. And that little piece at this moment in time as I record this on a Saturday has gotten over a thousand hits that three minutes and I will say let's just go to the, 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 the worst and the best. The worst was being called a monster um, and that nothing I could do was ever going to uh, really change the fact that I had done monstrous deeds and being able to respond to that in a healthy and a centered way. And the highest was that I've been invited to submit an abstract for an international conference in a couple of years, which gives me a whole beautiful piece of creative work to do around managing my own feelings about this piece of my medical training that I have great, great distress around. Having said that, bedtime story in detail. As you've heard of who I am, I now go on to say that I played the role of hero in my family and I know that and I ask you all to think a little bit about what roles you might have played in your family dynamics. Hero is um, a role that was described quite well in this book. It's called uh, A Way Out of Madness and it's written by Mackler and Morrissey. A Way Out of Madness and as you see that book and think about some of the questions they ask. It's talking about what you do in a family constellation when uh, you have been diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. And since that was my experience in 2005, I wanted to share from my seven years of living with madness on my record. Some of the issues in this book are fascinating. But let's skip straight to the point of how are you um, perceived in your family dynamics. They described beautiful work by Virginia Satir on family dynamics and many of us will play the role of caretakers and others of us play the role of the hero and that was my role as I said and some of us play the role of um, uh, identified um, problem person, the wounded one and others play the role of the lightning rod for everything bad that the family says is going on. The scapegoat. So those were the four roles described, and there are many more roles, but uh, dream on where you might have been in your own family dynamics and how that affects who you are today and what parts of that uh, identity you want to take forward and what parts you might want to let go of. As the hero who represented in my family not only this amazing you know, piece that I began to understand when I was a little girl. I mean, Lorraine Hansberry wrote a play called A Raisin in the Sun and it's an African-American play about moving out of the south side of Chicago and getting to your first suburban home and how difficult that was in a time of integration when integration wasn't happening and people would be willing to buy you out of living in their lily white neighborhood and the ethics and the egos involved with whether a black man would lower himself to do that buying out or not. And in that play is a character named Benita and um, I was my family's Benita. She is the bright one. She is the, the one that is going places. She is the one that's going to be a doctor. And um, the woman who played that role in the first movie version with Sidney Poitier was Diana Sands. And Diana Sands was another one of those um, brilliant, beautiful African descent women who died young. And so did the playwright, uh, Lorraine Hansberry another young, gifted, and black woman who died young. And as I share this with you, I want to say, uh, in the language of for colored girls who've considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, not isn't enough, please don't correct us in the Tyler Perry update, you know, is enough, all right? In that story, things go beyond my personal to my African descent uh, legacy to my being a woman. And uh, all of those things influence how I have to recover from my own spiritual emerge and see. In seven years in the process, I'm feeling quite delighted about where I'm going. 
a, that piece on circumcision uh, as I talk about where I am as a healer is evolving into where I am on radical anti-psychiatry feelings, thoughts, and beliefs. And it starts with the pain and the suffering that we as a culture impose upon a newborn infant. And we're talking about the boys, but my generation grew up with being birthed, being picked up by your feet and smacked on your bottom in order to make you take your first breath. What the? Can I just say that again? What the? What is that about? How did a culture ever, ever think in the healer place that that was a good thing to be doing with a child? And um, then we put these little drops in your eyes that stung um, silver nitrate, made the baby squint their eyes closed for the next 12, 24 hours. Some kids had a chemical reaction to it and got all pussy in their eyes. Well, that was better than gonorrhea. And I understand that gonorrhea is a terrible thing um, and that it was preventative. But my goodness, we, we have used so many healing modalities that were painful and traumatic and never acknowledged the pain and the trauma of using them. So that's another question to dream on a little bit. In your world, did you have any procedures, events, or traumas as an infant in your pre-verbal life that may be haunting in you in ways that you do not understand or that you may want to understand or that you may want to dream on? One of the responses to my video on circumcision was a man who described coming to terms with his own cellular memory of being circumcised. And I know for young people, these kinds of languaging, that might be kind of weird and wacko, but the truth is, I'm a menopausal woman. I have gone through menopause four years ago, and my brain has changed. And all that hormonal up and down that women get, ladies, I'm telling you this, it has a wonderful flavor when you get to be an elder. And I remember things from a long, 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 long time ago that I didn't remember easily before. And uh, to say that I remembered my birth experience and I remembered my first weeks of life, that may sound kind of weird, but I think you're going to find you're remembering a lot of stuff too. And if you don't, invent, because the creative force is also a force that can be used to be healing many, many, many ways and times. And I guess the last thing I want to say on this little segment of a bedtime story is, whew, and this is a big one, uh, I want you all to just remember I'm doing the best I can as I breathe through what I'm supposed to say next. And what I'm supposed to say next, Spirit says, is it's time for all the cutters of the world, whether they are men cutting men or men cutting women, or women cutting women, or women cutting men, or you know whatever combinations, whether it's female genital mutilation, or a routine infant circumcision, or a bris done by a rabbi, or whatever the Islamic people are still doing behind their closed doors in their privacy. It's time for all of us who have been agents of pain and suffering to admit where we are, take an inventory, and as spiritual beings, move forward. And I'm inviting the religious community into this dialogue. I am a healer. I am a spiritual being. There is such a thing as ritual abuse, and often the abusers are not aware or conscious of the abuse, and it has to be brought to our awake consciousness. Wake up, wake up, wherever you are. It's time to make the brisses a symbolic and not a literal cut, and it's time to take the FGM movement a step further beyond breaking the silence, which has been a wonderful, wonderful experience in the sub-Saharan African world. And it's time for Americans to recognize how we get psychically cut at early, early ages, and we're now medicating in every way you can imagine, but mainly with psychiatric meds. One in three Americans are on psychiatric meds. Required reading folk, Robert Whitaker. Anatomy of an Epidemic. I invite you all to wake up with me, and we can do it in ways that are supportive and not so painful. Yes.